Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips and tricks and the time management related to success of this particular examination. In this particular tutorial, we are continuing with the chapter one of the set B and uh, we are still talking about some of the critical and complicated questions which sometimes can have a very, very uh, high impact in determination of the right answer. So let's pick up the next question. The next question is question number four. It says, which test activity involves working with the test data requirements, test condition, test environment requirements and test cases? Now, I think the four major activities have been given to you and uh, these questions are not that complicated given that you are pretty much clear with what activities get performed as a part of each phase of the testing life cycle. If you remember, the test case uh, is written in test design phase, uh, test uh, conditions are converted into test cases or prioritized as a part of this phase and at the same time, more importantly, when it comes to test data requirements, it's a part of the test design, but uh, test case, uh, test data preparation, that is a part of the test implementation. Same way, environment needs identification and requirements are part of test design, and implementation of the environment happens in test implementation, like building the environment. So these are two different activities which are always, always seen as one of the key elements to dis differentiate between uh, the two phases, that is design and implementation. And I have highlighted this in my tutorials as well. So this is very crucial that you keep in mind that where do you identify the data requirements and where do you prepare the data and same way for the other that is environment. Where do you design the environment and where do you implement the environment? So I don't think we really have to put a lot of effort in this. To be frank, the very right answer for this particular question is A, that is test design, whereas the other options that is execution, analysis and implementations are not the relevant uh, phases to conduct this activity. That makes it very clear, but just having that knowledge would help you to get to that right answer. So let's look at the next question. The next question is question number five. And question number five says, uh, which of the following is most likely to impact how testing is performed for a given test object? Now, this sounds a little tricky because how testing is performed could have variety of options for you and you may have to pay a very, very deep attention before you conclude with the right answer. So let's see what exactly the options are trying to say. Option A says uh, the average level of experience of the organization's marketing team. Again, the marketing team should be very well highlighted here, so it should not be a problem. So because marketing team does not let us understand how to test the system. Okay, so we can rule this out. B says uh, the knowledge of users that a new system is being developed for them. First of all, knowledge of user does not make a big difference for us. In fact, uh, if it is user's knowledge which helps us to test, then we could have done the best possible testing so far in our life because we try to assume what exactly the user would tend to do and then test it having a user perception. But again, a user could be uh, very distinguishing from each other and they can have different expectations from the system. So again, a user's knowledge is not something which we basically look forward to apply in order to determine how to test a system. How to test a system is basically dependent on the factors like complexity, the factors like risk, or the effectiveness, what we are trying to achieve, or you know, what kind of criticality we have, what kind of risk we have to address, and many other things. And on top of it, the option also says that it is developing new system for them. So users are generally clueless when something new is coming. So that's not something what determines how testing can be done. Looking at option C, option C says the number of years of experience of the member of test team. Yeah, that looks relevant because this is what matters to us when determining how much testing to do or how to test a particular application because your past experience would add a lot of value that how you have previously tended to test the systems like the same and then you can certainly look forward to determine the areas which may, might need additional testing or more testing, etc. So C looks a little relevant. However, let's see the D before we conclude. The D says uh, the end user's organizational structure for a commercial music streaming application. Number one, they have not told you what type of application you're making. Second, the end user's organization structure does not matter. 
And again, even if it matters, they could be so distinct from each other because end users can be anyone. And uh, it could be wide audience as well, like for example, ATM software. In ATM software, I may have bankers, teachers, doctors, students, everyone, and their organization and structure is totally different. And how does this influence us to do what test we have to perform, right? However, it may matter in terms of usability testing, but they have not specifically mentioned that do we, want, we are talking about usability testing. They're talking about generic testing. And for generic as a testing to determine what to test is not something what we consider like this, right? So put together, the right answer for this particular question is C, the number of years experience of the members of the test team would certainly impact how testing is performed in the real world. Right. So this is how sometimes, uh, you know, a trickiness can be, you know, guiding this way. But just because we are discussing here, you may not feel it. But when you see it for the first time without a discussion, you would probably sometimes get confused. So this is the reason we are having this playlist to guide you well with what exactly to consider and what not what not to consider when answering the examinations. So let's go ahead and we look at the next question. The next question is question number six. And question number six says, which of the following statement is a correct example of the value of traceability? Again, I think we had a topic which listed all the traceability options and related to all the benefits to the traceability was covered in our chapter 1.4 segment. And uh, the, we discussed was exactly this. So let's go by the options to determine what is right and what is wrong. So option A says, uh, traceability between the mitigated risk and passing test cases provides a means of determining the level of residual risk. Hold on. This is the most fancy option what you would ever see as the right answer for traceability because we are talking about the risk and we are talking about the traceability with that of the test cases which are passing. Of course, it's a common assumption that the passing test cases will tell me what is remaining. Not exactly. Okay? Not exactly. Why? Because the tests, overall test case being linked to the risk will give me a clear picture of the residual risk. We are not talking about mitigated risk, okay? So passing tests can talk about the mitigated risk. But if you further pay attention, if a risk has five test cases, okay? If a risk has five test cases to mitigate it, and I have executed only three of them so far, and all three have passed, these three linked, the past test cases linked to risk, does not give me the estimation of mitigated risk or residual risk, correct? Because there are two more test cases to be executed. If you, you know, break this down like this, you would understand that however the looks, the option looks very, very, very appropriate, but it is not. Because only the passing test is what we link to determine mitigated and residual risk. No, I need all risk, all test cases to be linked to the risk in order to determine what is mitigated and what is pending to be done. And residual word means remaining to be mitigated. So I need all the test cases, not just the past test cases, irrespective of failed ones, to do this as a benefit of having traceability. Not correct, okay? Let's go with the option B. Option B says traceability between user's requirement and test execution results provide a means of measuring the project progress against business goals. And yes, and yes, that looks pretty correct. There's not, nothing wrong about it. The user requirements with that of the test execution results help management understand how exactly your executions are covering the requirement and how much success we have achieved, how much more to go. So test execution results basically display the entire execution detail and also includes the success rate like pass rate and fail rate. And based on that, we can measure the entire uh, project progress or testing progress with respect to that of the business goals because that is linked to the requirements. So this is one of the straightforward benefit of having traceability in the project. Whereas the option C says, option uh, C says traceability between testers and failing test cases provide a means of determining the skill level of tester. Wonderful. That's, that's, that's one of the uh, key attribute which you can always look forward to, but that's not something which we look forward to measure as a standard benefit of traceability. You can always have a link between developer and defect. You can always have the link between defect and a tester and how many te which tester found what number of defects to appreciate them and identify the you know, current skill of the testing team. But this is not one of the benefit of traceability. Okay, This can be extended for further users, but this is not a common benefit of having traceability because we don't do such things with respect to 
traceability in a project, right? Let's look at option D. Option D says uh, traceability between the identified risk and written test condition provides a means of determining which risk are worth testing. So identified risk and written test condition is not the factor which defines which risks are important to be tested. It is the risk management uh, process, which is more of like risk analysis. And we have activities like risk assessment to determine what exactly to test, what exactly not to test, how much to test, and all that gets answered as a part of this approach. So it's not that it's just uh, the uh, relationship between the identified risk and test condition, which defines what to test and what not to test. Okay, there is a process risk assessment, assessment which determines that. So that's how we make it simple, all right? So put together, the right answer for this particular question is B, that is traceability between user requirements and test execution results provides a means of measuring project progress against business scopes. And that's how sometimes a tricky question can also become simple if you just pay a little attention. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.